All right, here we go. So again, we're so sorry that it took us a few minutes to figure out the, technic, uh, the technical stuff. We're quite new to this. As you maybe already know, it is our first event that takes place here at the German American Institute, but as well is streamed online via YouTube. So again, sorry for the delay and now we can finally start. Okay, so welcome to today's event. How did it come to this? Afghanistan from 9-11 to the fall of Kabul. My name is Sophia and I will guide you through the evening. And as I already said, I'm very pleased to see some faces here in our hall again. Uh, but at the same time, I also want to greet our viewers online at home. And um, The current quarter has just begun and our new event program, as well as our language course and USA advising program is online. And for the people who are here today, you already have a printed version on your chair. So have a look and see what we are offering. Um, I explicitly want to mention three upcoming events. The first is our exhibition opening, um, We are showing photographs by Seth Lawless. The series is called Abandoned Malls. And we are celebrating the exhibition with an opening that takes place next Tuesday, September 21st at 7.30 p.m. at the Museumsgesellschaft Tübingen in the Obere Säle. The next thing I want to mention is a show called Katinka Kraft Grew Out of the Forest. It's a part of the Tübinger Bücherfest and it's on Sunday, September 26th. Uh, September 26th yes, at 11 a.m. in the Garden of the Evangelische Stift. And the third event, which fits perfectly to today's topic, um, is a panel discussion in German. It's called Zeitalter der Angst, Auswirkungen von Terror seit 2001. And it will take place on Wednesday, September 29th at uh, 7.15 as well here at the DAE and also online. I do have a small request actually. Um, you would help us a lot if you could take a few minutes at the end of uh, our event and give us feedback. For the people here, you have a piece of paper on your chair, simply mark it with a pen or even rip the sheet. And um, for our viewers online, there's a link in our info box where you get to a survey. So thank you for that. Um, if you do have any questions during the talk, we do have time at the end for a round of Q&A. So either I'll be coming down and hand over the microphone to you, so to say, or my colleague will uh, read out all the questions that are posted online in the YouTube chat. And without uh, any further ado, I'm really excited to introduce you to today's speaker, Matthew Kellogg. He is an MA Political Science and Administration graduate with experience in development of institutional funding applications in the humanitarian development and aid sectors and has capacity development experience in the areas of business development, proposal writing and project management. He has two bachelor degrees, one in German and one in political science. He also has a master in political science and he's currently doing another master in evaluation. Um, furthermore, he currently works in the public sector supporting German communities in their efforts to implement the UN's Agenda 2030. And he also has a history with us here at the German American Institute because he used to be a teacher here. And to get it started into the um, talk a bit, of course, he's American and his family has also personal connections to the tragic events of 9-11. So welcome, Matt. I'm so happy that you're here and the stage is yours. To everybody online, 
I'm sorry, these lights have made it quite warm in here, so I'm going to start uh, by making you wait while I take a drink of water. Mm. While we were dealing with the technical difficulties tonight, I was reminded of a, of a story, I, I don't know if it is true, but I've heard it multiple times about Neil Armstrong when he first landed on the moon. And they were supposed to broadcast the moon landing down to Earth uh, so that everybody could watch the great event. And one of the cameras didn't work. Uh, and so Neil apparently hit it with a hammer, after which it worked fine. Um, so sometimes, uh, in spite of all of our uh, best efforts, sometimes the best you can do is uh, hit the camera with a rock. Um, yeah, I have to say, it feels um, kind of strange to be back in Tübingen. It has been uh, a long time. There is a whole pandemic between uh, now and the last time I was here. Um, but it feels good uh, to be back, even if we are be going, be dealing with a rather difficult topic uh, this evening. Um, unfortunately, I cannot promise that uh, everybody will leave here with warm and fuzzy feelings, but I do hope that we can um, at least try to unpack the situation and uh, some of the important information um, in order to better understand what we've been watching over the past uh, now almost two months, um, or if we've been paying attention closer, the past almost 50 years in Afghanistan. Um, another reason it sort of feels weird for me to be here tonight is uh, I remember when we first here at the DAI began doing uh, a sort of a series of talks on September 11th as it was a Sternchen team for um, the Abitur here in Baden-Württemberg. Um, I remember uh, teaching, as, as, as we did this over the years, teaching this to kids who, of course, remain the same age, roughly the same, the same grade levels, attending the course. And eventually, you started to reach pupils who weren't old enough to really remember the events of that day, um, something that, for me, is so clearly in my mind. I, I'm such a person, I can't remember what I ate for breakfast yesterday. But I can tell you, in detail, every moment of that morning, um, from when I first heard about what happened uh, to where I was standing. Um, and obviously there's a direct link uh, for many of us between that day uh, and the events of the past 20 years. It was the catalyst that sparked um, deep American involvement and intervention in Afghanistan. Um, so anyway, we come, uh, we come finally to today. Um, for those of you who were watching throughout August, um, I, I know I was, uh, we were met with some fairly dramatic images, things um, that I think in some of our, our worst fears about what would happen uh, with the withdrawal, uh, many of those things unfortunately came true. Um, the American president said there was going to be no Saigon moment, and then we got images of people clinging to planes as they're leaving the airport. Now we should be careful about drawing parallels uh, and comparisons where they are weak and maybe don't exist in the way sometimes we imagine or we, we simplify things too much in our minds. Um, but for the average person watching, it can be difficult to say, well, what was the difference here? Uh, at least in the terms of the outcome. And it's a legitimate question for people to ask. Um, tonight, we're going to be talking about events that span nearly 50 years. And we're going to try to pack that inside of 60 minutes for you. That means, necessarily, there's a lot of information that we're not going to be able to cover. There's a lot of important points that we won't be able to get to, details that we're going to miss. But the goal of tonight's talk is going to be, do we have a technical issue? It's cool. We're good? Yeah, we're good. The goal of tonight's talk is going to be, hopefully, to have a somewhat better understanding of how we got this far in the first place. Um, so let's dive right into it. Um, on the 13th of November, 2001, fighters from the Northern Alliance, an alliance of warlords supported by NATO, entered Kabul, ending roughly five years of Taliban rule over the city. On the 15th of August, 2021, amid the withdrawal of international coalition forces, the Taliban re-entered the city uh, after about 20 years. We all saw the dramatic images of terrified civilians clinging to planes, uh, the rapid collapse of the central government, 
um, and white Taliban flags waving over the city, which led many of us to ask, how did it come to this? So what will we try to cover tonight? We're going to take a look at what Afghanistan looked at before 9-11 and how that has had a tremendous influence on Afghanistan today. We'll try to take a, a brief look at the rise of the Taliban as a, as a group. We'll take a look at corruption and its role in the conflict. Uh, we'll take a look at the inclusion of warlords in the Afghan government as well as persisting problems with the Afghan National Security and Defense Forces. And by looking at these issues, we hope to identify some, but maybe not all, of the key causes of collapse. So while we begin, let's take a look at Afghanistan, the country. Afghanistan is a landlocked country, the crossroads of South and Central Asia. Uh, like many countries, Afghanistan's history has been heavily influenced by its geography. Um, the geography of Afghanistan is defined by the Hindu Kush mountain range, which is an immensely high mountain range. Uh, the mountains themselves can be as high as 25,000 feet, or roughly 7,700 meters. The current population of Afghanistan is estimated to be around 40 million, uh, but is expected to reach 80 million by 2050. It is an incredibly young population uh, and growing fairly quickly. Um, as I said, these, these, are, these are estimates. Um, population figures should be considered uh, as an estimation. Um, it is incredibly difficult to conduct a reliable set, uh, census in uh, such a war-torn country. Um, the main ethnicities are Uzbeks, Tajiks, Pashtuns, and Hazara, but there are other smaller minority groups as well. There, the country has uh, relatively little in terms of oil and gas, but it does have huge mineral wealth in terms of gold, copper, and rare earths, such as lithium. I wanted to kind of show a map um, of just the ethnic sort of makeup of Afghanistan. It is an incredibly diverse country. So in the south and in the southeast, we have uh, predominantly Pashtun. In the middle, this green area here in the central area, we have uh, the Hazara, which is a group that experienced uh, ethnic cleansing at the hands of the Taliban during the 90s. Here in the north, mostly along the Uzbek border, uh, we have a large portion of ethnic Uzbeks uh, and Tajiks here in the northeast, including um, the now relatively famous Panjir Valley. I'd like to draw everybody's attention to this line. This is Afghanistan's border with Pakistan, and it is referred to as the Durand Line. Uh, it was named after British diplomat Sir Henry Mortimer Durand and forms the border with Pakistan and effectively runs directly through Pashtun tribal areas, uh, dividing them between the two countries. Um, this line, this border, and the division of these tribes and this, and this group into two um, is a significant source of issues between the two countries uh, until today. So let's take a look at Afghanistan before 2001. Um, for those of us who are still quite young, it's difficult to imagine a time in Afghanistan that looked really any different than it does today. Uh, the country has been involved in a civil war since at least uh, the late 70s. Um, and so it's difficult to imagine what it looked like before this. Um, we can, if we, especially if we're talking about the youth of today who don't remember uh, September 11th because they were too young, um, we can't expect them to imagine that, you know, to be able to imagine what Afghanistan looked like decades before that. Let's begin by looking at the Kingdom of Afghanistan. Uh, the Kingdom of Afghanistan was a constitutional monarchy uh, that pursued a policy of neutrality during the Cold War. Uh, its 1964 constitution established a parliament with the power to reject royal appointments, uh, universal suffrage, women's rights, and the right to form political parties. Uh, this constitution was seen as the first step towards establishing a modern democratic framework uh, and was pushed for, uh, in, in addition to others, uh, by the final king of Afghanistan, uh, Mohammad Zahir Shah, who was a proponent of modernization, education, and civil rights. Um, however, uh, political infighting was, uh, was a tremendous difficulty that they were unable to overcome at the time, and it prevented the establishment of political parties and it also prevented the devolution, the decentralization of power away from the king. What this means is that the municipalities, the local regions, uh, 
never really able to have any taste of self-government for themselves. Everything came directly from Kabul, if it came at all. Because it's always important to understand that the government, government rule was always very limited to the main cities. And the rural areas themselves very rarely felt the hand of government. Um, also important to know is that Afghanistan is a very rural population. As much as 80% of the population lives in these rural areas, outside of the reach of the government. Apologies. So in 1973, there was a relatively bloodless coup led by the king's cousin, Muhammad Daoud Khan. Uh, Daoud was essentially a dictator uh, who made use of socialist rhetoric to placate internal communist groups while doing very little to actually reform the country's economy. He abolished the monarchy in favor of a single party republic. Um, and this period is, is, is marked by uh, increasing autocratic rule increased military spending, uh, as well as economic stagnation. Khan pursued a policy of playing the great powers against each other, um, but he also sought is specifically military investments from the USSR. He used these, uh, the Soviets to build the Afghan military, hoping to gain control and influence over the Pashtun areas of Pakistan. So if you can recall, the Duran line that divided the, Pashtun, the Pashtuns into two separate, uh, into two separate states, Daoud wanted to use this, basically, to increase Pashtunization inside of Afghanistan. That means put the Pashtuns into, increasingly into places of power, um, disenfranchising more of Afghanistan's minorities, and using Soviet military aid to increase Afghanistan's control uh, and influence over these areas of Pakistan. The Soviets uh, were relatively happy to comply. This was, after all, the middle of the Cold War, and using socialist rhetoric was a great way to get Brezhnev on your side. Uh, however, uh, the Soviets were not, uh, were not so foolish as to think that they weren't trying to buy something with their military assistance to Afghanistan and attempted to increase their political influence over Daoud in return for military support. Um, this led Daoud to move away from the Soviets, to try to distance himself from them by seeking closer relations with the West. It was around this time that Afghanistan experienced the Sour Revolution. Uh, the Sour Revolution is named after the month in the Persian calendar during which the revolution occurred. Daoud and most of his family uh, were killed, and the remaining royal family members were arrested as he was, repla as he was replaced by leader Nur Muhammad Taraki. The revolution was a pro-Soviet military coup led by the People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan uh, and established the Democratic Republic of Afghanistan. Now, it's important to note that in spite of the pro-Soviet stance uh, and socialist rhetoric, um, the PDPA never referred to itself as communist, and we can imagine one very good reason why. Afghanistan was, back then, as now, a conservative, mostly rural, very intensely religious country. Religion holds a very important place in people's lives and their understanding of the world and the way the relationship should be. For an officially communist party to associate themselves directly with an officially atheist ideology can be problematic. And so this never occurred. The Sour Revolution did, however, also introduce gender equality under the law, as well as opening the political sphere to women, but also brutal repression and political violence. Um, during this time, there was a power struggle between the two heads of the PDPA, uh, Taraki and a man named Hafizullah Amin. Uh, the USSR, under Brezhnev, supported Taraki and actually planned to assassinate Amin, who everybody knew was actually attempting to replace Taraki. And we talk about this because during this time period, we need to understand where the deep destabilization of this state comes from. How did things fall apart so dramatically that it has been such a struggle to put the pieces back together today? So the assassination attempt fails, and Taraki is arrested. Taraki, the head of the Afghan state at this time. Amin then calls Brezhnev. Uh, receives his support to do as he sees fit, executes Taraki, uh, and believes that he has Soviet support, even securing a treaty with the Soviet Union in December of 1978, that allowed him to call upon Soviet forces to stabilize his rule in Afghanistan. Now, if we know something a little bit about the history of Afghanistan, especially if we, can, if we know something about the Soviet invasion uh, during the 1980s, we can see the roots of what is about to happen taking place right here. 
It was around this time that we also see the birth of the Mujahideen. So the Taraki Amin government introduced a number of reforms to Islamic civil and marriage law, as well as harsh land reforms. These reforms proved deeply unpopular with the conservative rural population. And it's important to note that contrary to popular memory, the Mujahideen did not begin as a revolt against the Soviet occupation. It started right here um, as resistance to the first, uh, first Taraki's and the later Amin's harsh rule. Um, it conflicted with the rural population's conservative and religious values, uh, as well as with the traditional power and influence structure uh, that were in place by local uh, tribal leaders, local strongmen. The government responded to this, uh, to uprisings with increased repression uh, in rural areas, as well as mass executions of village leaders, uh, as well as religious leaders. The central government never had that strong presence uh, in these rural areas. Um, neither during the kingdom, neither later after the Sour Revolution, not under Daoud, um, and not later in the coming civil wars. For many people in the rural areas of, of Afghanistan, this repression would be their first experience dealing with the power of the central government. The first experience that they would make with centralized rule would be something, somebody coming and knocking on their doors in their village to identify local leaders who would then be taken away. This is not a great way for establishing trust or good relations with the rural population. Now, resistance increased, no matter really what the central government did. The central government did not really attempt to use soft gloves to win back support of the rural population. They responded pri predominantly with oppression. Um, and the resistance coalesced around a number of independent groups that we collectively refer to as the Mujahideen. Similar to the Taliban today, this is not one group that we're talking about. Rather, these are geographically and ideologically independent groups of one another that collectively fall under the umbrella term Mujahideen. So let's take a look at the Soviet invasion itself, just very briefly. Uh, the invasion is preceded by a very slow buildup of Soviet forces in Afghanistan. These, were, these Soviet troops were invited by the Amin government to support his rule in the country. Remember, he had that treaty with the Soviet Union allowing him to do so. So Amin would call Brezhnev and say, I need more soldiers. My army is unreliable. Please send assistance. There was initial hesitation from the Soviet side to actually get deeply involved in, in, in Afghanistan. It was not that they decided overnight, OK, uh, we're sending all the troops over the border and invading the country. This took a little bit of time. But eventually, the Soviets did comply uh, and sent Amin the aid that he requested. However. They also felt that Amin himself was part of the problem, that Amin himself was part of the issue creating these uprisings, creating the instability inside of Afghanistan. And so they came up with a plan to, one, simultaneously support the central government, while, B, getting rid of Amin. So the Soviet invasion was launched on October 31st of 1979. Um, Soviet troops, under uh, using civilian airlines, landed in Kabul. Um, attacked the presidential palace, uh, assassinated Amin, and replaced him with a man named Babrak Karmal. Now, we won't talk so much about Karmal, but it's important to know that Karmal was nothing more than a puppet. Um, he would famously say to a personal friend, the Soviet comrades love me boundlessly, and for the sake of my own personal safety, they don't obey even my orders. Um, Karmal would eventually grow so unpopular in Afghanistan that the Soviets would, seem, would recognize the same problem with Karmal that they recognized with Amin. They blamed him for a lot of the failures, and so they would eventually replace him uh, with a man named Mohammad Najibullah, who was effectively a KGB-trained um, head of Afga Afghanistan Secret Service. Um, the conflict is essentially uh, marked by Soviet control over cities, as well as highways, uh, and Mujahid Mujahideen control over the rural areas. So I'll use our little Handy pointer here, I hope you can all see our red mark. These red areas were the areas predominantly under Soviet and Afghan central government control. And the other areas were divided up amongst the, uh, the various, the various um, Mujahideen groups. Something else that was important to note during this time, um, this would mark some of the first increased Western intervention uh, into Afghanistan in the form of American, Pakistani, and also Saudi Arabian support for the Mujahideen. Um, 
This took place uh, under what was known as Operation Cyclone. Now, there was very little American presence actually on the ground. The way that this predominantly worked is that the United States gave financial, um, gave financial and military assistance to Pakistan, who gave it then in turn to the Mujahideen. Um, this had some advantages. The Pakistanis uh, had a much easier job infiltrating into Afghanistan uh, than the Americans did. They had more knowledge of their area than the Americans did. It also had some downsides. It gave Pakistan a significant amount of control over where the uh, assistance was actually going. And so as we said before, there's not one Mujahideen group. There's multiple groups. Some of them uh, would later go on to become uh, parts of what is now the Taliban. There were, of course, uh, the early roots of al-Qaeda in Afghanistan at the time. They were not yet al-Qaeda in the way we understand it today. Um, there was even a Maoist group uh, that was part of the Mujahideen that survived in, well into the 2000s. Um, and there was uh, other groups that we might consider, of course, we have to consider we are still in the Afghan context, but that would maybe be more, shall we say, agreeable with Westerners, uh, maybe generally more supportive of uh, Western understandings of human rights, uh, of women's rights, uh, democratization. Now, uh, Pakistan had uh, their own interests in Afghanistan, and they used this support to their own ends. And they also had significant support from the American government to do this. Um, one of the things that they did is they supported a Mujahideen group that was predominantly ethnically Pashtun. We'll talk more about them later. Uh, but this is something that the Americans themselves would later say was a significant mistake and a missed opportunity. Effectively, the Americans themselves admit that during this time, they gave support to the wrong group. Not that they regretted giving support to the Mujahideen in general, but that they gave support effectively to this Pashtun group that was largely being supported by the Pakistan government, rather than a man named Ahmad Shah Massoud, uh, who we will talk about a little bit later. So shortly after the Soviet withdrawal uh, in February of 1989, uh, the Afghan central government, much, uh, much in a similar way to as, as, we were, as we were expecting to see today, the Soviets didn't simply just pack up and leave. They left, uh, they built an army, not a very good one, but there was one there. Uh, they supplied it before they left, and then they packed up and left. For the Americans, uh, the process was similar. They had trained up an army during this time, they had given it supplies, and then they left, uh, and then it collapsed. Now, in the Soviet case, the central government was able to survive actually a little bit longer. Um, but the national government was still uh, entirely dependent on aid from the Soviet Union, which ended with the Soviet Union's collapse in 1991. Um, one of the most important factors of this was there was no more fuel being sent uh, by the Soviet Union to support the Afghan military, especially the Air Force, um, which meant that the Afghan Air Force could no longer fly. The Afghan Air Force was the predominant instrument that allowed the government to stay in power um, because it was a, a, a significant source of power for the central government over Mujahideen forces. Um, another uh, significant issue were food shortages that arose from ending shipments from the USSR to Afghanistan, which meant that the central government could no longer supply its soldiers with food, nor could it pay them. What this meant wasn't that everybody just went home. These soldiers were there, it was a job for them. And so what inevitably happened here is that they ended up looking to those who could secure payment and food for them. Generally speaking, this was local leaders. Um, so we see a situation where you have local military officers in different regions of Afghanistan become economically dominant in their sectors, and the line between what was the national army and what is now a militia, a local militia, starts to become very fuzzy and no longer so clear. We have to imagine uh, a situation not unlike medieval fiefs, where you would have a military officer or somebody with power, somebody with soldiers, with guns, who could establish dominance over a certain piece of territory, a certain piece of ground, and then could use their military muscle to extract economic gain from this area, which they would then use to pay their forces and the cycle would continue like this. And those forces would stay loyal to that military leader because, well, that, was, that military leader was now their source of livelihood. Um, so as the government became unable to provide payment and supplies, troops become loyal to these local leaders. And those local leaders would, in turn, only stay loyal to Kabul 
if the government could keep them supplied and in power locally. Uh, so many of these leaders, these local leaders that had been formerly military officers for the government would eventually defect, switch sides to the Mujahideen. And one famous example of this is a man named Abdul Rashid Dostum, uh, who was a general in the, for the army of the central government, um, who once he understood the central government would no longer supply him, uh, switched sides and said, I am now fighting for the Mujahideen. Um, and this was a significant step in the collapse of that central government and its inability to continue its own existence. I want to come and bring a little bit of attention to another um, significant leader in Mujahideen forces and a man who would remain relevant throughout this entire story that we're going to be telling tonight. Um, Dostum, who I just mentioned, will also stick around and be with us for this entire story as will many of these other military leaders. Um, it's important to understand that uh, these, this collapse of the central government and the development of these local areas under the control of strongmen, who then extract economic gain from these areas, is essential to understand why Afghanistan looks, in many ways, the, the way that it does today. A lot of those leaders are still with us. So to bring our attention back to uh, Ahmad Shah Massoud. Ahmad Shah Massoud is considered a very rather controversial figure in Afghanistan. Uh, some consider him a national hero who could have been a unifying force in the country. Others uh, consider him a war criminal. Um, I'd like to take a little bit of time uh, and spend with him this evening. So for those of us who were able to remember the initial invasion of Afghanistan, we might remember the Northern Alliance. Now, the Northern Alliance to describe it as simply as possible, was a group, an alliance of warlords, focused mostly in the northern part of the country, predominantly ethnic Tajiks and ethnic Uzbeks, who resisted Taliban rule. The Taliban did not have control over all of Afghanistan. The northern third of the country remained under the control of these separate warlords. The leader of whom was a man named Ahmad Shah Massoud. Um, now, Massoud was an ethnic Tajik, from the Panjir Valley, which is a mountainous valley just north of Kabul. And he became famous uh, for successfully defending the Panjir Valley from a number of Soviet offensive during the Soviet invasion. Uh, during this time, he earned for himself the nickname the Lion of Panjir. Um, he's also been referred to as the Afghan who won the Cold War. Now, Massoud is interesting because this is the man that Western forces would have been working with had he survived until the invasion uh, when it occurred in mid-September of 2001. Uh, but he was assassinated by Al-Qaeda on September 9th of that year, two days before the September 11th attacks. Massoud was relatively progressive in areas under his, under his control. And unlike other warlords, Massoud was able to exert a certain amount of discipline in his fighters that we don't see with many of the other militias. Now, he was not perfect. Um, there was at least one case where he was directly involved in war crimes. But, on the other hand, Massoud also rejected the Taliban's fundamentalist interpretation of Islam. Um, he led the resistance against their rule. Um, he established legal gender equality um, in areas under his control. He allowed women to participate in politics, education, and work, and, and in other areas of life. Nobody needed to wear the burqa by law in his, uh, in his regions, though well, they could if they wanted to. Um, he was known to have personally intervened against cases of forced marriage in areas under his control. And he also established democratic institutions uh, in local villages in this area so that people actually had their first taste of uh, democracy in this region that they had had in decades. So with that, we need to come back to the Afghan Civil War. Now, uh, in 1992, we see the Battle of Kabul. Um, the Battle of Kabul was a, was a battle between effectively three separate warlord groups. I'll try not to go too far into the details about this as it gets relatively complex, but the important thing to know is that um, during this time period, most of Afghanistan, you know, its infrastructure, everything that had been built up in the years of peace, the roads, the schools, the hospitals, everything, experienced significant levels of destruction. Um, in the Battle of Kabul, it was not like the fall of Kabul that we witnessed today. It was, in fact, a, a very bloody affair. There was a lot of fighting inside the city. 
uh, predominantly between a man named Gulbuddin Hekmatar, uh, who was an ethnic Pashtun supported by Pakistan, um, specifically Pakistan's inter-services intelligence, which is something akin to the Pakistani CIA. Um, now, Hekmatar, with the support of Pakistan, was quite determined to establish his own rule over uh, significant portions of Afghanistan, uh, predominantly the Pashtun areas, but more if he could. This forced an alliance between two people who were, did not really compatible uh, in the name of Ahmad Shah Massoud on the one hand uh, and Rashid Dostum on the other, who was involved in many war crimes himself. These two were not necessarily people who agreed with each other out of principle. As a matter of fact, they also fought against each other during this period. This period is marked by shifting alliances and peace treaties and agreements with this group fighting this group tomorrow, but fighting the next group and working together the next day. Uh, but Hekmatar, uh, because of a lot of the financial and, and military support he was receiving from Pakistan, um, is able to become quite powerful, and Dostum and Massoud agree to work together to defeat him. They do stop him in the Battle of Kabul. But it is around this time that the last leader of the Afghan central government that was established, the communist central government um, under Najibullah, finally, she finally gives up his power as he realizes his forces can no longer defend Kabul. So he surrenders, he gives up. Um, but he cannot flee the city. He goes and he turns himself into United Nations headquarters based in Kabul. Uh, when the Taliban take over the city a few years later, uh, they will forcefully take uh, Najibullah from UN headquarters, who are unable to evacuate him, um, where he was then very publicly executed in a very, very cruel way. Yeah, it's considered a, a fairly significant failure of the United Nations that they were not able to withdraw him from the country. And this met uh, widespread condemnation across the Muslim world. The other significant event that we see in 1992 is the so-called Peshawar Accord. This was the first significant attempt at peace inside of Afghanistan since the, since the, uh, the country began its, its road into collapse in the 70s. And this created a new state, the Islamic State of Afghanistan, which was essentially going to be an interim unity government made up with uh, different warlords, powerful warlords, who agreed to work together to establish peace inside the country. This would be rejected by Hakmatar um, in his attempts to take over the country. It's around, uh, it's just after this time period, uh, while, these, while these various warlord groups are fighting each other, that we start to see the rise of the Taliban. Uh, here we see a picture of Muhammad Omar, founder of the Taliban. Um, this group would appear uh, around 1994. Uh, in the city of Kandahar. Uh, Kandahar at this time was dominated by Hekmatar's uh, militia forces, but is also local warlords as well. The Taliban uh, felt that Hekmatar's forces were uh, oppressing their traditional ways of life, uh, were stamping over religious values, and were generally just being uh, uh, criminals themselves. And so the Taliban formed basically to begin doing uh, vigilante attacks against Hekmatar's forces in Kandahar. They arose essentially in rebellion to the warlords. Um, this is significant because how many of you are familiar with Hamid Karzai? Hamid Karzai is a name I think most of us who have spent any time looking at Afghanistan know. He was the first president of Afghanistan after the American invasion. During this time, the Taliban had support from Hamid Karzai. Hamid Karzai is also an ethnic Pashtun. Um, and the general consensus at the time was that the Taliban were quite strict. Uh, they were fundamentalists. But people were so upset and so were suffering so much under the rule of the warlords that the Taliban offered a different choice. And they were seen by many as establishing peace and stability in the areas under their control. It was through this that they were able to actually gain a significant amount of support during, this year, during these years. So the literal meaning of Taliban is uh, students. As we said, they were able to expand really rapidly across southern Afghanistan. Um, and by 1996, they were in control of the capital and many other areas as well. So here uh, we can see a map of the country in 1996 with the green areas uh, are the areas under Taliban rule. And these areas in the north are uh, those under control of the Northern Alliance that we discussed. <laughs> 
So at this point, um, especially as we move forward into discussing September 11th and the American invasion, we should understand Taliban's cooperation with Al-Qaeda. There was a relatively long history of cooperation between the two uh, organizations. Um, Bin Laden was active with the Mujahideen throughout the 1980s and again after 19, uh, 1996. Uh, and the Taliban were able to make use of Bin Laden as a sort of cheerleader for their cause. They could draw upon his wealth, Bin Laden a famously from a famously rich Saudi Arabian family, his fame as somebody who successfully fought against the Soviets in Afghanistan, um, and his other various business connections. They could use this as a valuable asset. Uh, Bin Laden, in turn, supported the, supported the fight against the Northern Alliance. They trained in an international brigade, brigade of fighters, uh, which then was used to fight against the enemies of the Taliban inside Afghanistan. The Taliban were able to offer Bin Laden a safe haven for Al-Qaeda to, uh, to train these fighters. So according to the 9-11 Commission, the American Commission to study um, the, the, the causes of September 11th, between 10 and 20,000 fighters passed through these camps during these years of cooperation in Afghanistan. Uh, they also uh, assassinated Ahmad Shah Massoud, who was seen as the primary enemy of the Taliban during this time. And no, they assassinated him two days before the attacks in New York and in Washington. Um, and there's, uh, the consideration is that there were some links here, that they knew that if there was going to be an inter intervention inside of Afghanistan by Western forces, that Massoud, somebody who had recently just spoken to European Parliament, before he was assassinated, would probably be the person that the Westerners would use inside the country to establish a new government. And Massoud was immensely popular and remains immensely popular in many regions of Afghanistan until his day. Now, the final bit of cooperation that we really saw um, that we can talk about before we talk about September 11th was after the attacks, one of the Americans' conditions uh, for not invading Afghanistan was that the Taliban would turn over Osama bin Laden and other leaders of Al-Qaeda to the United States government. The Taliban did not do this. There are many uh, theories as to why they did not do this, um, but there's also some consideration that even if they wanted to do this, it is, it is possible that they maybe could not have done it. Um, Osama bin Laden was surrounded by many of his own supporters during this period, and we, we shouldn't imagine Taliban rule over these areas under their uh, that were under their control as to be something as with an iron fist. They also didn't know always what was going on inside these territories or where Osama bin Laden was at all times. Um, and we should also keep in mind that uh, the might of the United States military combined with the German military and the British military and the Australian military and local Afghans failed to capture bin Laden at the Battle of Tora Bora where they were pretty sure they did know where he was. Um, and so it's reasonable to think that even if the Taliban wanted to turn over bin Laden, it is, it is possible that they might not have even been able to do this, even if they had decided to do so. Regardless, they did not do so, and, Muhammad, uh, and Mullah Omar had basically said that they uh, did not want to. So at this point, we've traversed a significant portion of Afghan history, slaying the groundwork for what was going to be the Western uh, intervention inside of the country. As we can see, the situation at this point was already immensely complex. There are many moving pieces, many actors involved. And then the West gets involved and adds to this. So we know uh, all of us here, I think, are familiar with the, with the attacks themselves, but just as a brief recap, uh, because we do have to remember there are now younger people who today, today who do not remember this. Um, the September 11th attacks were Al-Qaeda terrorist attacks uh, that targeted the World Trade Center, the Pentagon, and the Capitol. To date, there have been 2,977 who were killed. This includes those who died as a direct result of the attacks uh, from effects such as cancer and other things that developed because they were there that day, not because they were there when the towers fell. Um, and there were around an estimated 25,000 wounded. There were 19 hijackers, uh, including Mohammed Atta Marwan al Shay and Ramzi bin al-Shib. There was one Egyptian, one Lebanese, two Emiratis, 15 Saudi nationals. Now, the three named uh, hijackers here were from the infamous Hamburg cell, uh, which met and planned right here in Germany uh, before carrying out the attacks. The victims, 
uh, include victims from over 90 different countries, including 11 Germans. Um, and these casualty numbers, just as we said before, because they include those who are dying because of effects or injuries that they received during the attacks, this will, this will, this will continue to increase. Um, at this point, uh, I'd like to show people a, um, a short video clip that was taken by a CBS cameraman who happened to be in Manhattan um, during the attack. Some of you might be familiar with some of this footage, but it's quite dramatic. And when we were specifically discussing September 11th, I showed this um, to some of the, from some of the Abitur students um, as they were too young to really see the images that day themselves. This is a way to sort of introduce the, dr the dramatic effect that those images had on the people who experienced them that day. So if you'll just bear with me for one second, I need to go out uh, and show you this way. We'll begin. Just to introduce the clip to you real quick, uh, we will be, the CBS cameraman is interviewing a man who was inside the towers, who has just climbed down out of the towers. The towers are still standing at this point. I hope you can hear. Uh, I can't put subtitles for you, um, but I hope this is uh, still clear enough for us to um, perceive now. Who are you with? I was on the 81st floor. Tell me what you saw and heard. I just somehow had 40 people in there, just the explosion. There's a light flash out my, my window. My whole doorway to the entrance of my office blew open. My, my office was freaking out, and I just told them to calm down and get to the center of the office. Everybody was fine on my floor, and we just started heading down the stairs. I heard people were trapped in the bathroom. I ran to the bathroom. It was just blown out. I asked if anybody was in there. People weren't in there. So I started going down the steps. I heard people shouting. I stopped at like 68, and there's a woman in a wheelchair. And, and, uh, and I got her in the strap wheelchair and just carried her down the steps and carried her down <coughs> 68 floors, man. And then we got lost on the fifth floor. It was, it was chaos. It was just, what do you work for? Uh, Network Plus Communications Company out of... Uh, See if I can Randolph you, Mass. How do you spell it? Mike Benfanti, B E N F A N T E. Thank you, Mike. It's chaos. Man. Could everybody understand Mike here well enough? Every I, I've shown this video clip 20, 30 times, and every time I hear it, it's it's it's, it's a really dramatic story. Um, carrying somebody down 68 flights of stairs. Um, and you can tell, I mean, we just pause it here just by chance, but you can tell the expression that he's wearing. I mean, it's just it's an indescribable, just really indescribable trauma. Um, unfortunately, that was something very similar to what most of the country was feeling that day. And I think even beyond the borders of the United States, it was something that I think I've also spoken to Germans, uh, French, British about what they experienced this day. Uh, and all of them stopped and were focused on Manhattan for this moment in time. Um, I'd like to show you just one, another little short clip here. Um, the man doesn't say much, but I'd like you to observe his body language and just look how he looks. Because for me, uh, I, I have, I've not yet found a more, um, a better clip that symbolizes, I think, how people were feeling that day. Thank you. Do you know where everybody's going? No, I don't. 
So we'll stop the clip there. Um, just with those dramatic images of the towers falling. And for me, the man just, uh, for me, I, every time I see this, um, when he asks, you know, hey, can I ask you a couple of questions? And his response, no, I'm having a really bad day. Is, um, it's almost difficult not to laugh just because you want to say to the guy, man, you are having the worst day of days. <laughs> um, but then, I don't know, that image as he walks, just sort of dragging his bag behind him, um, I don't know, it's a, power, it's a powerful image. So normally during the September 11th presentation, we would go a little bit more in depth um, as sort of the next steps that arose out of this, a little bit more about some of the specific details and the events leading up to it. But the important thing to note is that this was the catalyst that would relaunch America's involvement in Afghanistan after the Soviet invasion. So let's just take a brief look at what that invasion actually looked like. <clears throat> the, invasion, the invasion was different from the invasions we would come to see two years later with the invasion of Iraq, where we see huge numbers of troops moving across the border, tanks, mechanized units racing to Baghdad. The war in Afghanistan was, signif was significantly different. Most of the fighting was actually done by local warlords. Uh, the Northern Alliance forces that we introduced before were supported by mostly NATO special forces, predominantly American, British, uh, Canadian, Australian, uh, as well as NATO air power to support those local forces as they more or less overran the collapsing Taliban. Um, the, uh, the collapse was, uh, did unfold rather quickly. Um, within, I believe within about a month, uh, most, of the, most of the major fighting was over and Kabul had fallen. Um, but we also see during this time not just the success of the forces on the ground, but we also see the inability of allied forces to actually prevent the leadership of the Taliban, of Al-Qaeda, to escape into Pakistan. Now, we shouldn't make any real mistakes about it. The Taliban at this point was, uh, had been effectively decimated. Uh, many of the formerly loyal Taliban fighters were leaving the organization. Many of the others, especially the experienced ones, um, had been eliminated during the fighting. Um, there was a chance, an opportunity here, uh, to probably disassemble the organization had they been able to capture this leadership, or at least the years that followed would look significantly different. Uh, but indeed, they failed. Um, shortly after the fighting, we come to uh, the Bonn Conference. Uh, the Bonn Conference was effectively the conference that established the Afghan interim government uh, and selected Hamid Karzai, who had been a leader within the Northern Alliance, effectively a warlord on the ground, uh, to be the interim president. One thing that we don't want to gloss over here um, were a number of war crimes committed by NATO forces. Uh, we don't want to ignore these because of the humanitarian impacts. Uh, How's that? Is that a, yeah? Okay. So I'll take the chance while I'm trying to put this back into my pocket uh, just to say, I know this is a lot. It's a lot to cover. It's a lot of information. There's a lot of details. Um, but a lot of this, all, I tried, I did my best to really take only the stuff that is really significant to leading up to today directly. And unfortunately, to really understand Afghanistan and to really understand how we came to this moment, these are important pieces of the puzzle to understand. So to come back to the Bonn Conference, uh, no, sorry, we had just moved past that. We were uh, dealing with the war crimes by NATO. Um, now, these war crimes, beyond the, the, the crimes that they were in themselves, it's also important to understand them in the fact that they, they did obviously contribute to increased difficulty actually ever winning hearts and minds of the local population. You're not going to win any hearts and minds 
by committing crimes against these people. Um, just as some examples of these, there was one contractor who was uh, charged with assault with a dangerous weapon, killing a prisoner at a U.S. base. There were five, soldier, five U.S. soldiers charged with the murder of three Afghan civilians. There was a British Royal Marine who was convicted of the murder of a wounded Afghan fighter. Uh, he would receive a life sentence, though this was later reduced to seven years. There was the Kandahar Massacre, a terrible crime by uh, U.S. soldier Robert Bales, uh, who was also sentenced to life in prison. Um, and another was the uh, rather infamous bombing of a hospital in Kunduz that was operated by Doctors Without Borders um, by an American airstrike that was called in by local Afghan forces. This is just a selection of some. Uh, there are others, and any list we could do here would be unexhaustive um, and take us, that's a topic for itself. But we don't want to, um, we don't want to ignore those. So after the fighting is concluded, we enter the next steps of building a government. And this is, though there would be elections, the government that would then be supported by the Western powers uh, until it finally collapsed on August 15th. Now initially, there was a significant focus um, headed, by, uh, headed by Karzai, who put a great emphasis on representation of, my, of, my, of all major ethnicities inside the country. Um, so we will see that ministers and people picked out from ministerial positions were selected from uh, across the different major ethnicities. Uh, there were two female ministers. Um, this is obviously not much, but it was a significant change from the Taliban rule that had come previously. Uh, one of these was uh, Seema Samar, who was the Minister of Women's Affairs, as well as uh, Suhaila Sadiq, who had, had been Minister of Health even back under the old communist regime and was brought back to be Minister of Health again under uh, the interim government. Um, now, building this government, uh, warlords were placed in uh, many of the significant ministerial positions. Uh, some examples of this are the defense minister, Mohammed Fahim, uh, who supported uh, Masood, who was an ethnic Tajik. There was the planning minister, Haji Mohammed Mohakik, who was an anti-Taliban warlord. He was Hazara. Uh, there was the water and energy minister, Mohammed Shakir Kagar, who was a United Islamic Front fighter. He was Uzbek. Uh, and there was the Small Industries Minister Mohammed Arif Nurzai, United Islamic Front, and he was Pashtun. Um, I mention this now because it becomes significant, especially when we start to discuss issues of corruption inside of Afghanistan and how this actually took place. Um, to bring it back uh, to building the government here, the emphasis was placed on creating a, a strong central state uh, that in truth did not really match the reality on the ground inside of Afghanistan. Um, the central government had never been able to, in Afghanistan, exert its authority over rural areas, um, and it definitely wasn't going to be able to in its early years when it had just been effectively recreated. Um, but one reason that uh, supported this line of thought for creating a strong central government in Kabul was they needed to create ways to tie the warlords to the central government. You can imagine if all of the resources of the state flow through the central government, and those warlords are dependent upon those resources for their local survival, there's a chance that they stay loyal to the government, they support the government, and it creates a sort of stable feedback, uh, feedback loop between those warlords and the central government. I hope everybody uh, I hope that was able to make that clear for everybody because it is an important concept as we move forward to deal with corruption itself inside the country. So having a look at development assistance, assistance, assistance and cooperation, um, just a brief overview of some of the important, uh, some important concepts. Um, the United States alone spent 825 billion United States dollars on military costs related to the war and another, and another 130 billion uh, United States dollars on reconstruction. That means official development aid. If you include interest on debt, veterans care costs, um, the total amount spent by the United States over the last 20 years was closer to two trillion United States dollars. Um, now we can talk a lot about uh, the actual products that were produced as a result of development assistance in development cooperation. But one thing that we should also focus on are some of the negative side effects that uh, development assistance can have on local populations. Uh, a significant one is brain drain. Uh, development organizations often pay much better than the local economy could ever hope to pay. 
Um, this means that the best educated, the best staff uh, in Afghanistan, they sought employment with international NGOs, as they often paid much more than what that local economy could provide. Uh, this creates brain drain, basically taking the best and the brightest out of the Afghan population and having them work for the international organizations rather than, say, for example, Afghan organizations. There were some early successes uh, of official development assistance. Um, part of this has to do with the fact that when everything is so destroyed, it is very easy to, to gain some easy, quick victories in your development assistance. If there are no schools, it is relatively easy to build a couple new ones and to show this effect quickly. As you have started to build those easy to produce um, development products, it becomes harder later on down the road. Uh, essentially, you can imagine it's like picking fruit from the tree. You're taking the easiest stuff first, and then the, harder st the, hard the longer you go on, the harder it gets to reach new outcomes and goals. Um, this was something that happened here in Afghanistan as well. Um, one example that we can see of this is uh, if we look at the literacy rate in the country. The literacy rate was 18% in Afghanistan in 1979. It was 31% in 2011 after 10 years of occupation and 43% in 2018. Now, this is a significant climb, 43% compared to 11. But if we consider in the years between 2018 uh, and 2011, we see that that growth had started to slow. Things are starting to slow down. It is not as easy to achieve the outcomes that we want to anymore. Um, another way to look at it, this is uh, the Human Development Index inside of Afghanistan. So, the Human Development Index, it is a measure of life expectancy at birth, education, uh, the level of education, and uh, the gross national income measured at purchasing power, power parity inside the country. Uh, we see that inside of Afghanistan, this stagnated, effectively stopped moving um, after about 2010. So in the year 2000, the HDI in Afghanistan was 0.35. In 2010, it was 0.47. But in 2019, it was 0.51 which means that it had hardly grown at all. Another important thing, actually, uh, some research that was done by a former professor of mine out of the University of Ottawa, um, was to show how uh, Afghanistan is a country obviously suffering from severe instability and violence, how development assistance itself contributes to that violence by encouraging, uh, by basically encouraging the targeting of that violence, uh, by incentivizing um, increased corruption, um, and uh, basically promoting, uh, promoting violence to encourage uh, either that development assistance not to be carried out or to be carried out in certain areas or under certain conditions. Um, if any of you are more interested, we don't have time to go really into the details on this, but if you have um, an interest in this topic, I can recommend um, the paper by Christoph Zürcher called The Folly of Aid for Stabilization. He is an expert on uh, the post-Soviet conflicts that have taken place in the post-Soviet space, uh, including the war in Afghanistan. So with that, I want to move on to what corruption inside of Afghanistan looked like. And this was one of the, one of the, key, uh, the key issues faced um, when trying to reconstruct the country. So to understand uh, the corruption, we need to understand two key forms of corruption, namely patrimonialism and state capture. Uh, patrimonialism uh, is defined by German sociologist Max Weber as a social political order where patrons secure the loyalty and support of clients by giving them benefits to them for their own, from their own or state resources. So an example could be offices of power being used for personal gains uh, and there's no strict division of private and public spheres. Uh, the state acts as a resource to be mined. So an example of this might be, I am the minister of energy. And rather than providing energy the way that I am supposed to, in the level that I am supposed to, I take a little bit off the top, or a lot off the top, depending on how much I think I can get away with. And I use those funds for myself, or to support that militia that is waiting in my region uh, back in Herat, for example. Um, this brings us to state capture. Uh, state capture is a form of corruption wherein laws, norms, and government bureaucracy are manipulated by government officials, state-backed or private companies, and individuals so in, as to influence the state's policies and laws in their own personal favor. Um, 
Another uh, significant issue that we would see that also isn't directly involved with the state of corruption inside of Afghanistan is the growth of organized crime and drug trafficking. So state officials uh, or soldiers, the military, uh, would use protection rackets uh, against civilians in the areas under their control. So they would essentially go into local shops and say, ah, it is a very dangerous place, you need security, and then take some money from these people that would then go into their pockets. Um, Afghan National Police, also guilty of, of some, some similar rackets. Um, Afghanistan is one of the leading producers of heroin in the world. Um, one of the reasons for this is because of how easy it is to grow opium and what a useful crop it is, especially for the poor or in very unstable situations. Now, officially, uh, there were many efforts uh, to reduce the growth of opium inside of Afghanistan, but what would often happen is local military leaders or governors or administrators would allow it to happen and take some of the profits for themselves. So another thing we should look at is the use of development assistance uh, to encourage rent seeking. So the classic example of rent seeking as a form of corruption um, is that of a property owner, or in this case, oftentimes, let's say the state or a powerful official in a, in a region, um, installs a chain across a river uh, that flows through the land um, and then hires a collector to charge passing boats uh, a fee to lower the chain so that they may pass. Um, there's nothing productive about this behavior. All it does is take from the economy. Um, they're taking rent, effectively, in this case. Uh, this was, again, something that was very common inside of Afghanistan throughout, uh, throughout the last 20 years, but also before. Um, then some final, the final concept to understand is that um, we have, I've, I've shown a couple, I'll, I will continue to show some maps of Afghanistan that show the districts, the official states and borders inside of the country. But it is important to remember mm -hmm. that these official boundaries often don't match up with the actual areas of control on the ground. You could have a situation where one governor um, has a huge militia, and his militia has power over his province, but also the next province. And he might not be governor in that province, but because his militia is the one on the streets, you can imagine who gets to make the rules. Now, um, just as to put a final figure on there for you, um, we can take a look at Afghanistan's Corruption Perception Index the country is ranked 165 out of 180 for the last time that that was actually measured. Um, essentially, near the bottom, it, once you get so close to the bottom, it just starts kind of being a bunch of countries in a very similar, um, very negative state. So with this, I would like uh, to show you um, a clip from a documentary um, that makes, uh, that kind of goes into what some of this corruption actually looked like. What you're going to see is a United States Marine who was part of the reconstruction effort whose job it was to find sources of corruption and try to deal with them. Um, he will explain some of them uh, here. I need to actually close out, yeah, like before. So I'll stop it there. He gets into a bit of a different topic here, but you can see the effect of corruption directly here. Now, um, get it, we can go much deeper into this about why many of the Afghan soldiers, for example, would do this and would take this. One of the reasons, for example, is that oftentimes their own officers would steal their salaries. And so those, those Afghan National Police or the Afghan National Army soldiers might not have been paid in the last three months. And so they will find what methods that they can to earn money for themselves. And this might be one of them. But you can also see um, what happens if taking and stealing and then selling military hardware at the local bazaar, you can see it leaves the Afghan National Police in a state where they cannot actually fulfill their job. While at the same time, who do you think shops at the same bazaar that they're selling, these, that they're selling this equipment? The Taliban does. So with that, uh, we can look into some of the more, some of, the more of the issues um, that Western forces encountered while trying to build and train the Afghan National Defense and Security Forces. Um, so the Afghan National Defense and Security Forces, the training of them began in about 2002. Um, initially, United States Special Operations uh, took over training the Army. Germany, for example, was heavily involved training the National Police uh, 
The United Kingdom was involved training uh, counter, counter narcotics. Italy was involved trading the justice system. It was a fairly international effort from the beginning. One of the decisions that they needed to make at the beginning was a conflict between quality and quantity. Do we want quality soldiers or do we want a lot of soldiers? This is not such a simple, uh, simple thing to answer as it might seem. Of course, we want a lot of quality soldiers so that we can secure the country and bring peace and stability. But um, there are some realities that we need to deal with. On the one hand, the new Afghan government cannot handle all of a sudden taking command over a significantly large force. So the decision was initially made to train a smaller but rather well-trained force, something akin to the commandos that maybe we have heard a lot about in the last weeks and months, um, but a smaller force. But this would mean that they would not be present everywhere in Afghanistan. Now, there were still a lot of international forces in the country at the time, so maybe they thought this wasn't, such a big, uh, this wasn't necessarily such a big deal, or this was a price that they were going to have to pay, but this was the initial decision in the beginning. What we will see is starting around 2010, this priority changes. And rather than training a small number of high quality soldiers, it, became, it becomes a battle to get as many people into the Afghan National Defense and Security Forces as possible, which also means that the quality of those security forces drops dramatically. Some of the systemic hurdles uh, that, we, that we see throughout this process are things like extreme rates of illiteracy. Remember those rates of literacy that I read off before? Uh, one significant advantage that Western militaries have is that they're drawing from a middle class or a lower class that has achieved a certain level of education. This makes them easier to train and more effective later. This does not exist in Afghanistan. It did not exist at the time. Um, it became such a problem that while training, uh, while training the Afghan National Army, they had to extend the training process by five weeks just to include a unit on literacy and teaching people to read so that they could understand how to read maps, how to, take, how to read their orders. This was not possible for many of them before. Um, and I want to point out, this is not because the Afghan soldiers were somehow stupid. Far from it. They were growing up in a context where there was oftentimes no schools or no education to speak of. Um, they did not grow up in the context where that form of education would have been available to them. Um, another uh, significant hurdle was that uh, you have, you're dealing with that corruption, that state capture, that patrimonialism at all levels. And so one example of what this would look like in terms of the Afghan National Army is those, and especially those special forces commandos, Afghan commandos that we heard about towards the end of the war, is that those commandos, highly trained, well-equipped, would then be used to protect the private property, the luxury villas of some important politicians rather than actually permitting, uh, permitted to do their jobs out in the field. Um, now another issue that happened, although this changed sort of over time, was that the army was initially composed of fighters from those militias that we talked about at the beginning. Um, those militias, those warlords, had a history of abusing the Afghan people, fighting against the Afghan people. And now just because they're wearing a uniform doesn't mean that the Afghan population necessarily trusts them. Um, this, would generally, this would genuinely change, uh, especially later on. There's a nice survey um, done in around 2016 that goes into uh, the attitude of the Afghan population towards the military, towards the Afghan National Police. We do see that generally speaking, Afghans are, uh, have warmer feelings, if not totally warm, towards the Afghan National Army. Uh, whereas towards the Afghan National Police, the feelings were generally more cold. Um, there's a, you can look, uh, we won't go into it here, but there's a 2016 survey that you can look, in, look into on that. Um, some of the other persisting problems with uh, the Defense and Security Forces were that uneducated population that we spoke about. Another was attrition. Um, so what attrition here means is high amounts of casualties or simply soldiers abandoning their posts and deserting, um, which would meant that you're investing time and energy and effort and money in training soldiers. And at, what would happen is every year an estimated one quarter or one third of the Afghan army would either become casualty, which means they're no longer able to fight, or would just leave. And what this meant was every year they're having to train not just one army, but effectively train a new army again, year after year after year after year. 
this significantly hinders your progress in actually creating, for example, experienced officers or experienced sergeants, people who are able to lead the soldiers under their command. Um, we discussed also the corruption issue, but one, one example that has become quite famous is the use of ghost soldiers. Um, these are soldiers who are officially on the payroll, um, but are not actually, they don't actually exist. Uh, to give you an example of how widespread the problem was, just in, alone in 2019, 42,000 names were removed from the lists. These were people who had been collecting money, usually the commanders of a unit uh, would be collecting this money and putting it into their pocket or spending it for their own resources, collecting them for the, for the soldiers. Um, it's estimated that 70% of police positions in southern Afghanistan um, were ghost positions. They didn't actually exist, 70%. Um, were still within that army unit and no one knows who they were. Yeah. So this is obviously just one clip, but it does uh, paint some of one of, the, uh, one of the issues that was faced. So I know we're short on time, so I'm gonna to try to press through this next part as, uh, as quickly as I can. But finally, as the decision was made by Western powers to pull out of Afghanistan, uh, the significant agreement that governed this was the Doha Agreement. In the picture here, we have U.S. Representative Zalmay Khalizad and the Taliban Representative uh, Abdul Ghani Baradar. Um, this was an agreement made with the Paladin, uh, uh, Taliban um, as Donald Trump was still president. Um, according to this agreement, NATO was supposed to withdraw by May 1st of 2021, and in return, the Taliban would commit to prevent al-Qaeda from operating in Afghanistan while continuing negotiations with the Afghan government. Important to note, uh, is that there, while they were committed to peace with the, Af the NATO forces as they were withdrawing, they were not committed to peace with the Afghan government forces. So at this, I would like to, we're coming to the, the summer offensive that we saw this year. And I'm just gonna flip through some, uh, some slides here. Um, so we can see the yellow areas are areas contested between the government forces um, and Taliban forces. Uh, blue are government forces, and uh, the red are those under Taliban control. So on the 9th of July this year, this was what the situation on Afghanistan was, uh, at least officially. As we move forward, the 19th of July, we see um, Taliban control expanding, fighting continues. Here we are at the 6th of August, one week before the fall of, of, uh, of Kabul. The 13th of August, the 15th of August, 16th of August. This last little yellow portion, this is the location of the Panjir Valley, where actually there is still some resistance to the Taliban going on. So the offensive officially began on May 1st, 2021, and all of this information is still too fresh to really give a proper analysis of what happened. There's obviously a lot of hurt feelings, a lot of anger, a lot of frustration, and so you have to kind of take anything that you read um, officially, unofficially, with a grain of salt. Um, one uh, explanation that was offered for why the Taliban was able to move so quickly during this period where they hadn't been before um, was reduced air US airstrikes um, and the Afghan National Army strategy of trying to protect cities, uh, meaning that the Taliban could move more freely on the road than they had been able to before. Um, the Americans were conducting airstrikes inside of Afghanistan all the way up uh, until the 15th at least. So it's difficult to say whether or not this is actually the case, but it is one. Um, proposed uh, reason why things happened the way they did. Um, according to some reports, the United States had actually advised the Afghan government to concentrate their defense around those urban centers, uh, very similar to what the Soviet Union had tried uh, and failed to do. But the government chose a strategy of trying to defend more everything. They had an unreliable national army, and so they put a lot of weight on their special forces, those commando forces, who eventually es essentially got exhausted uh, and could no longer really put up resistance. There were significant amounts of defections to the Taliban. Um, a defection in conflict in general is not uncommon, um, especially in the final months of a conflict as it becomes clear one side is going to win. Um, we should remember Rashid Dostum had uh, defected from the government. He was one of the warlords we talked about during the 90s. He defected from the government to the Mujahideen and here, he was officially fighting for the government again, and he quickly fled across the border with his forces as it became clear the Taliban was going to win. Uh, he is now in Uzbekistan. Uh, President Ghani finally flees the country on August 15th, and we see a snowball effect 
uh, of negotiated surrenders and payoffs with local commanders. So basically, as more and more commanders surrender, as the Taliban gains control of more and more cities, the spread becomes more rapid as other commanders say, well, why should we fight? Nobody else is. And then the whole thing is over. One quote from a USAID official said, rural Afghans didn't feel like their government could protect them. And we couldn't change that, no matter how much we built, how many people we employed, or how much they liked us for it. All of us, I think, can recall the images of the evacuation, uh, dramatic as they were. Um, so the rapid government collapse meant that initial evacuation plans that expected a government collapse over three to six months were obviously no longer viable. Um, something that I think didn't get enough coverage during the collapse is that the evacuation was taking place at Hamid Karzai Airport uh, with the use of effectively a single airstrip. Um, as an example of how many flights were coming through here during that time, Al Jazeera tracked 170 flights between August 15th and 16th, 128 of them coming from the United States, 12 from the United Kingdom, uh, four from Germany, and the rest making up the rest. So there's a tremendous amount of flights taking place on one airstrip. Um, it does effectively bring back images of the Berlin airlift back from the 1950s. It was, regardless of, 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 of all else, th that logistical feat of those planes going through so quickly uh, under the conditions that they were in, it is an achievement, um, even if we are not satisfied with it. Um, there are still many uh, still trapped in Afghanistan. Obviously, no, not everyone was able to get out. Um, I myself have contacts who are still stuck on the Afghan side of the border, um, many of them still trying to flee the country. And so we come to Afghanistan today. 20 years after September 11th, 2001, and 48 years after the overthrow of the king, the country is still in turmoil. Despite one of the largest airlifts in history, many were left behind, and many of those who supported international programs of the Afghan government are still seeking to flee the country. Resistance to Taliban rule continues in the Panjir Valley, led by Ahmad Massoud, the son of Ahmad Shah Massoud, uh, and Amrullah Saleh, the acting, uh, the acting president. He was the vice president to, uh, I mean, Karzai, or not, sorry, uh, Ashraf Ghani. The country remains on the brink of economic collapse. Um, food is running short, as is money. Um, and some numbers say that by the end of the month, um, there won't be enough food to go around. And the casualties here are impossible to calculate. We don't actually, we probably will never really have a clear understanding of how, just how many people died during this conflict. Um, it's over 70,000 Afghan National Defense and Security Forces died. That number is probably higher. Um, Coalition forces, there were 3,576 killed, including 2,420 Americans and 62 Germans, 39,037 contractors, and the official number is 46,000 civilians, but that is also um, probably very much lower than it actually was. So with our final slide, um, I know it took time to get here, but I hope that the information um, helps to put together some of the pieces so we can understand the events of the last two months. How did it come to this? The 1973 coup against King Mohammad Zahir Shah, um, where we saw those last vestiges of any forms of stability in Afghanistan really break away. The Soviet-aligned Sour Revolution, which alienated those rural populations um, and created the basis for the Mujahideen that would arise later, giving birth to those warlords that became so influential over Afghanistan for until today. We have the Mujahideen fighting against the government and the Soviets and the civil war between those warlords and the rise of the Taliban. This finally leading to the American-led invasion after 9-11 uh, and the reconstruction efforts to rebuild a central government. The failure to capture those leaders, the Taliban resurgence, endemic corruption and unreliable security forces. Um, and then finally, after 20 years, the simple exhaustion of the political will of Western forces to continue. Um, and the withdrawal of those forces and the rapid collapse of the central government. Thank you. So, thank you. <laughs> well, thank <laughs> yes, thank you. So, Matt, thank you so much for this talk today. You gave us much to on, much to think about. Um, I don't know, are there any questions from your side yet?
because actually I do have a question. Um, I, as a woman, fear for the female population of Afghanistan. Um, because of the Taliban rule, I'm afraid that um, the girls and the women are not getting the same treatment as they have been getting before. It's going back to how it was. Um, I just heard that, for example, in universities, the uh, women are separated separated from uh, the men by, for example, a curtain. They have to leave earlier. Um, do you think it's getting any worse than that? Maybe I should, uh, I think, step over here um, for our Q&A session. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, it's a very reasonable question, and I think it's a fear that a lot of people have, um, especially Afghan women. Um, it's impossible at this point to say what will happen in the future. Um, at the moment, there is still a lot of international attention on the events that are happening in Kabul. Um, it is uh, the place in Afghanistan where there is most the most access of for foreigners, um, even after the collapse of the government. Um, and so what we are seeing there is uh, obviously the Taliban implementing their rule over the city. Um, that means um, new dress codes for the women, sort of regressing back to the years that we saw under Taliban rule in the early 90s. But for now, we also see, for example, continued access to universities, at least for some women. Um, that's not something to be happy about. The, the step, this, it's very clear here that the steps here are a clear regression uh, of, some, of some of the progress that was made over the, the last 20 years. I think the important thing to note is um, we can't say for certain what's going to come tomorrow. There's still a lot of negotiations going on between the Taliban and Western governments. Um, some might say the Taliban is still trying to use a softer touch. Um, I say that while cringing a little bit because the Taliban has also been firing at uh, innocent protesters, for example. We've seen the images of uh, the new enforced dress for women. Um, and of course, so it's difficult to describe this as a, a soft touch, right? Um, but what that means is as long as negotiations are still ongoing, um, for example, access to the finances of the former um, Afghan national government have still not been granted the t to the Taliban. Um, that means the Taliban has an incentive to try to show a softer image than what they might want. What that means is if they find out, if they get access to those finances, maybe they come with conditions, and so things are not in a way that we would like, there's going to be a lot of bad news coming out of Afghanistan for the foreseeable future. Um, but it might not mean a total regression back to the levels that we saw in the 1990s. Um, on the other hand, um, it could also mean that uh, if the Taliban either gets or does not get that financial assistance that they are seeking, they might decide, well, we don't care, and they'll just implement what they actually want, um, if this is not what that is. Um, I think it's important to be skeptical of anything that we are hearing at the moment. Um, and yeah, we continue to watch with concern uh, what's unfolding there. It's difficult to give a clear answer on that for now, but uh, I think we should prepare for a lot of unhappy news. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for your opinion. Do we have a second question from the audience, also from our online audience? Actually, check one, two. Yes, you can hear me. <laughs> um, actually, I have a question. Um, it's more on the political side concerning uh, President Biden. We knew Biden during the election period and after the election until, well, the fall of Kabul as a very, let's say, nice guy. He stood for decency. Um, he was the body of the nation. He was a very understanding and caring character. And um, in this whole fall of Kabul and um, the withdrawal from Afghanistan, he more or less uh, turned out to be more rough, like not really caring, um, and it felt like he was without the necessary empathy for the things happening. And uh, like he said, the Afghans are more or less, it's their own fault that things turned out like they turned out. And uh, what do you think? How is this sudden change, ex is it explainable? And uh, yeah, is there a way to grip his change, sudden change of character in some way? What do you think? So not a politician, um, and so it's difficult for me to understand the political calculus that is going on in his mind at the time. Um, 
I think there's a number of possible explanations uh, for this. Um, and one of them is the simple fact that a withdrawal under these circumstances was never going to be pretty. Um, and it is a, at, at some point, he, what, one thing I think, I, I think, I say this with, try to maintain a neutral uh, posture here, but one thing I think that the president uh, deserves some credit for is the fact that um, he has said himself, the buck stops with him. Um, responsibility for the withdrawal is with him. Um, I will say he has, of course, qualified that by saying, I'm under the conditions of my predecessor and uh, the deals that he made. Um, but it is, uh, bless you. Um, <laughs> but it is, uh, it is a difficult sell. At the end of the day, the Americans are leaving. And words of empathy are important. Um, understanding the, uh, the difficult situation that Afghans are being left in is important. But that's not going to change facts and realities on the ground, um, at least not at the time being. Um, I can say I am in contact with a lot of people who are intimately involved with the evacuation, with people on the ground in Afghanistan. One difference that I heard from international media, both German, American, British, um, and from them, was that they didn't seem to have such a negative opinion on, uh, the, on, the, on the evacuation efforts on the, those final two weeks that I heard in the media. Um, those are some private opinions, obviously, but uh, I guess to come back to your question, it is, as the President of the United States, he, uh, he may, be, may be making that political calculus that my personal empathy needs to be towards the American people. Um, again, it's not a pretty look. Um, and he is a president who I think has uh, a lot of his political popularity came from his ability to show empathy in difficult moments. But he's also been uh, an advocate from withdrawing for Afghanistan for a very long time. And I think this is, uh, I can imagine that at some point he made the decision, okay, we're doing this, now let's get it done. Um, you can criticize some of those steps and some of the decision processes behind it, and maybe he didn't show enough empathy. Um, I think that's going to be something that only he'll ever really be able to explain in detail. I hope that answers the question. I know it's a difficult one, but... Um, it's a difficult one, yeah, but it's cool. Thank you. All right, and I see a raised hand. Just a moment. I was just going to, I was just going to piggyback off your comment, and that is that really, um, you know, his previous predecessors, Obama and Trump, really should have ed ended it maybe sooner, but he, Biden does have the political will, or he had the political will to do it. It was messy, it was awful, but it needed to be done. So that's just yeah. political will. That is an important point, and is, uh, is something that I think uh, supporters of his decision have, um, have vocalized. Um, the information that we talked about here today, it's important to say this is taken from, most of it is taken from relatively old documents. None of this is a surprise. The level of corruption, the ineffectiveness of the security forces, the way that the corrupt structures inside of the Afghan government functioned, this was known. Um, we can criticize uh, a lot of decisions made at a lot of points along in the process, um, but be the United States military, the United States politicians, they had an understanding of what the situation was. As a matter of fact, this was one of the severe criticisms of them as it was revealed that uh, they were actually intentionally misleading the American people for a long time about the war in Afghanistan and about progress that had not been made. Um, and there was a president who then made the decision to leave. Um, one thing Biden said that I think is true, um, if a difficult pill to swallow, is that you, for the United States, for the Western powers here, you're going to have to make a choice. And the choice was going to be staying in Afghanistan for a very long time with uncertain outcomes um, or saying enough is enough and leaving. And they made their choice. Um, I'm sure we will be arguing about that choice for, well, we're still arguing about Vietnam. So um, I imagine that this won't be so different. Okay, thank you. Um, it's getting a bit late, but I think we have time for one last question. So here it goes. Um, yeah, you said that a lot of people are still trying to flee the country. Yeah. Um, so my question is, 
what is the perspective for those who are still trying to flee Afghanistan? And because I recently heard something about the first civilian flight that landed in Kabul. Um, yeah, that was my question. So, yeah, uh, it's a great question. Unless you're referring to a flight that I haven't heard of yet, uh, those flights are still only carrying uh, foreign nationals, foreign citizens, or citizens who have dual citizenship. So, for example, an Afghan citizen who also has, let's say, American citizenship or uh, British citizenship. They are, they are being allowed to leave, or the ones that have left. For those who are only Afghans, um, the situation remains very uncertain. I don't want to give too many personal details for my contacts that are there, but um, I know, for example, people who are officially registered with the United States government and who are officially registered with the German government who are currently not able to leave. One of the reasons that they are not able to leave is that the countries around Afghanistan are not allowing them to enter the country. There, um, we have seen, um, for example, with the case in Libya or in Turkey, that there are um, smugglers who will then uh, take money to smuggle people across into Europe. Um, at the moment, um, I don't want to say none of this is going on in Afghanistan, but I have heard it in at least one case that the smuggling operations have been shut down at the moment because the smugglers are too afraid to uh, operate uh, with the Taliban in their area. Uh, whether or not that stays that way, whether or not it's a temporary situation, and by the way, uh, the smugglers are terrible themselves. Um, so I'm not saying this to support them in any way, but that is one way that people use to get across the border and then seek refuge in countries outside of Afghanistan. That seems to not be working so much at the moment. Um, Western governments, including the German government um, and the American government, are currently negotiating with those countries, specifically predominantly Uzbekistan, uh, Tajikistan. Pakistan has still closed the border. There's questions about whether or not they might open it up again. Um, to allow some of those uh, officially registered with Western governments to get out. Um, another question is whether or not the Taliban allows them to leave. Now, that, is an open, that is an open issue. What we're seeing right now is a combination of two things. One, it's a chaotic situation, and a lot of people are dealing with unfamiliar territory right now, and it takes time to develop the processes to allow um, well, people to move in a, um, a semi-controlled fashion. Um, the other thing that's happening right now is that the countries around Afghanistan, as well as the Taliban themselves, are using those who are still stuck inside Afghanistan as a political bargaining chip. Um, so for example, the Uzbeks and the Tajiks and what well, the Taliban themselves, they're sitting on something that they know that the Western governments have a political pressure to ensure uh, successfully they are able to take out of the country. And they're not going to give that up for free. Um, and so while those negotiations are going on, you can expect to see things like, for example, increased German aid, um, aid payments to Central Asian countries. We've already seen some. Um, I expect that'll probably continue. Um, it's my personal opinion, but um, um, I think that's something to keep an eye out for. Um, but I do believe Laschet said recently that that process could still take months. Um, and that is, unfortunately, time that uh, at least the people that I'm in contact with do not have, to put it simply. All right, I think that was our last question. Um, I'm sorry, I understand. It was a lot to digest, and it is a long presentation. Um, but I hope it was interesting for you. I hope you could take something from it and I could answer maybe some of your questions. Um, I think as time goes on, we'll have uh, a better understanding of everything that happened. But by looking back in time, I think we can see a lot of the important pieces for understanding what happened today. They've been there for a while. Um, so I guess with that, I'll, I'll say thank you all for coming out, uh, for participating with us, for dealing with our technical difficulties here at the beginning. Um, and yes, you almost already said everything I wanted to say, but Sorry. thank you, Matt, for coming here today for this wonderful, informative talk. And um, also, yeah, just thanks for being here uh, in present. And also, thank you for being here today. And thank you, our online viewers, as well. Um, there's nothing really more to say except for please do fill out the um, feedback survey that would really help us a lot to improve our hybrid talks. And uh, with those last words, um, thanks for being here. Have a nice evening and see you next time.